Our sermon series this month is Crosswalk. And we, we, we know when we um, think about a crosswalk, we think about carrying our cross. As every believer has been mandated to do, each and every one of us here has a cross uh, to carry, a, a, a cross to bear. But there's also the crosswalk that we use when we're crossing the street, right? What is that? That's a, a, a little section carved out for you in the street. It's in between two lines. Uh, and uh, th- when that light turns green, the little man begins to flash. Uh, you're now given the okay to cross. You're given the okay to, to cross across this street. Uh, there's always an inherent danger. But uh, we know that being in that crosswalk, uh, when that light is green and you have the okay to go, that you're able to get from one place to another within the, that confinement of those two lines. You're not walking into oncoming traffic. Uh, You're not uh, in the middle of the street slowing down traffic, uh, but you're in a safe spot. Uh, And I was kind of thinking about that. That's how like the Word of God is. The Word of God is a crosswalk. It it sets up a a parameter for us to walk in so that we can get from where we're at uh, to where God wants us to be. And when we are obedient to, to the word of God and obedient to the, uh, to the spirit of God, uh, God moves us from where we're at uh, into that next level. And, and tonight, uh, we're going to open up with a message on deliverance. And I've titled this message, My Song of Deliverance. We serve a good God. We were just worshiping him, and you could sense the presence of God in this place. Uh, You can sense his goodness. You can sense that he's uh, doing something. He's preparing our hearts. Uh, And if you've been walking with God any amount of time, you know he's a good God personally. I think if we were to just say, you know what, no preaching tonight. We're just going to pass a microphone around, and and we're all going to give testimonies of what God has done in our lives. Uh, We would be here until tomorrow morning. We'd be here until Sunday morning just sharing the goodness of Jesus Christ uh, and what he's done in our lives and how he's saved us, uh, how he's changed us, uh, how he's cleansed us, uh, how he's redeemed us, uh, how he's healed us, the miracles that God has done in and within our lives. Uh, We could be here for days. How he's delivered us from the bondages and from the grips of the enemy. We serve a mighty God, and the Bible says that there is nothing impossible for him. We look throughout scripture as for examples how he delivered his people when he delivered the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt. And as they were escaping Egypt and as they were escaping Pharaohs and all of a sudden there's a Red Sea in front of them, uh, how he delivered them through that Red Sea. He parted the sea and he made a way for them. We see how he delivered Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den. Daniel was a man of God. He was a man of prayer. And because of his faithfulness to God, he was uh, persecuted and put into the lion's den. But God was faithful and he shut the mouths of the lions. He shut the, uh, the, the he, he helped Daniel's three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, as, as they too took a stand for God and, and decided that they weren't going to bow down to the world and to that idol, and they were thrown into a fiery furnace, and yet God delivered them out of that fiery furnace. He delivered Esther and her people from impending genocide. He, he delivered David from the lion, from the bear, and from the giant, uh, And from all of David's enemies, uh, David understood that God delivered him from all of his enemies. He delivered the madman at Gadara that was tormented by a legion of demons. He was, the Bible says he was put in his right mind. And he was sitting there at the feet of Jesus. He delivered the woman at the well from a life of adultery and fornication. and, And from all the hurt and the shame and the pain that that kind of lifestyle brings. He delivered Lazarus. From death. Ain't that an awesome thing? That, uh, that at the name of Jesus, even death has to be obedient. Uh, that when Jesus speaks, even death has to obey and has to give up. Uh, and, 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 and he was able to resurrect Lazarus. So many of us here, we could tell our personal testimonies and stories of the awesomeness and the power of God in our lives. Uh, How maybe we at one point might have wrestled with addictions, uh, with drugs and alcohol, whatever it might be, and we no longer have those cravings uh, because Jesus has set us free, because Jesus did something on the inside. Uh, 
And when others said, uh, he's impossible, she's impossible, they'll never change. Uh, well, thank God for praying uh, fathers and mothers, and thank God for praying churches uh, that we see some of those impossible people here tonight uh, worshiping God. The book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. He says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. When we're talking about deliverance, what we're talking about is freedom. Deliverance equals freedom. And deliverance can be defined as a rescue from bondage uh, or danger. And deliverance uh, in a person's life comes through the person of Jesus Christ uh, and through the work that he did on the cross. Uh, the Bible in, uh, says in Romans 4.25 that he, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins. And he was raised to life for our justification. Isaiah 53.10 says, his soul was made an offering for sin. We understand that Jesus died because of sin. But we need to make it personal tonight. Jesus died because of my sin. He died because of your sin. He died because that sin separated us from God the Father. And his love for you and I uh, led him to give the ultimate sacrifice, his life. Sin will always bring a destruction in a person's life. Uh, whether saved or unsaved, sin will always bring a destruction. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. From the moment uh, that Adam and Eve uh, took a bite of that uh, fruit and rebelled against God uh, till present day, there's always been a consequence uh, of sin. A spiritual death uh, that even leads to a physical death. And when Jesus died, when he hung on that cross, uh, he fulfilled the requirement to atone for our sins. That perfect, uh, sinless lamb of God uh, that he sacrificed himself uh, so that you and I can taste freedom, so that you and I can be free from the bondages of sin, so that you and I can experience the goodness uh, of Jesus Christ in our lives. Uh, he broke the power of sin and death. Uh, he conquered the enemy. Uh, that's good news tonight, uh, that uh, we, can have, we can make heaven our home uh, by receiving Jesus Christ and that awesome gift that he has given us, the gift of salvation. The Bible says that he's called us out of darkness and he's placed us in a marvelous light uh, that we can see. We can see the error of our ways. Uh, we can see the strategies of the enemy. We can see the hand of God working in our lives. That's what light does uh, in our lives. Uh, and he pulled us, uh, the Bible says, out of that miry pit. That miry pit. Uh, you, when I think of a miry pit, I think of just quicksand. That no matter how hard you struggle and no matter how hard you try, uh, rather than being able to come up and come out of it, you just seem to be sinking and sinking deeper and deeper. And the Bible says that he pulled us out of that pit uh, and he placed us on a solid rock, but he cleansed us. He washed us. Uh, he renewed us. Uh, man, it feels so good to be clean because of Jesus. You ever, you ever just, uh, we had... Um, heat wave last week man it was hot and just sitting in your house watching tv if you don't have ac you just sweat right you get all sticky and ugly and you feel just kind of gross and if, and if you're out there working any kind of uh, laborious job you know that you can get dirty you can get grimy and and then you just take a, a nice hot or cold shower and all of a sudden you feel refreshed you feel brand new. You feel rested. Why? Because all the grime and all the muck and all the dirt and all the junk uh, is just washed off of you. And, and that is a picture of what Jesus does in our lives. Uh, all of that just stain of sin that's on us, Jesus cleanses us in his blood and he washes us clean and we're refreshed and we're new. We're born again, the Bible says. 
Jesus, though, he gives us a warning. Because we needed to learn how to develop a lifestyle that's rooted in Jesus. A lifestyle of praise and worship. A, a lifestyle that we fill ourselves with the promises of God. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, it says, When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but it finds none. And then it says, I will return to the person I came from. And so it returns and it finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. And the spirit finds seven other uh, spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and they live there. And so that person is worse off than before. And that will be the experience of this evil generation. What the Bible is warning us here is that if we've experienced the cleansing of Jesus Christ, if we've experienced uh, that washing, that renewing of our minds, uh, if we've experienced uh, that, uh, that brand new life, uh, we can't just go on living as usual, business as usual. There's got to be change within our lives. There's got to be a change in our lifestyle, in our, in our mindset, in our habits. Uh, we've got to fill ourselves with Jesus Christ. Jesus has to take residence in our life. Uh, the Holy Spirit has to take residence in our life uh, and live there and govern in there. Otherwise, uh, we'll leave ourselves open once again to the schemes and the strategies of the enemy. I work on a college campus, and there's this building, and for years it was abandoned because it was a, an old science building. And they built a brand new science building, and so the professors and the students, uh, their experiments, uh, they all went to this new uh, science building, and the old building was left empty. The lab equipment was still there, some of it, you know, the office furniture, the chairs, but it was clean. It was cleaned out, completely clean and empty. And, uh, you know, a homeless individual... Uh, made his way into that building and um, took up residence in that building because nobody was going in there and checking what was going on. They weren't uh, checking at night to make sure that there was nobody in there that was supposed to be in there. They, they uh, didn't, uh, I guess the lights on in the middle of the night wasn't a, a, a tip to go check it out. Uh, but what this individual did, and this is a true story, is that he went and he called his friends. And so they started partying in this science building. Now, this is an eight-story building. And what they did was they just thrashed the building. They thrashed the, the, the office furniture, the equipment. Uh, they broke windows. Uh, they busted the plumbing. Uh, they just left this place in ruins because it was never checked on. It was never... It was never investigated. It was, it was just left empty, and they figured it would be fine, and it would stay clean. And that's the picture that Jesus has given us. we got to take inventory of our lives. We, through the word of God, uh, is there something in our lives that is not supposed to be there? Is there something in our lives that God is saying, I'm dealing with you on this issue. we got to get rid of this, uh, because all this does is invite other things uh, into your life. They're called squatters. A squatter is someone that takes residence uh, in a home or in a building that they have no business, uh, they have no authority, they have no permission to be there. And the enemy is constantly trying to send squatters into our lives. Anger, resentment, unforgiveness, those are squatters. They don't belong in our lives. Lust, jealousy, envy, those are squatters. They don't belong in our lives. Hatred, impatience, loss of temper, uh, fits of rage, uh, all these are squatters uh, that need to be kicked out of our lives. Uh, they don't belong in our lives. Uh. And how do we do that? We do that by the word of God. In John 8:31, it says, "If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth." and the truth shall make you free. Now, Jojo Gaxiola used this scripture last year, or excuse me, last week. It was last year. He used this scripture last week, and, uh, and it was a, a scripture that I had already um, was using, and I said, man, God's speaking to us. God's speaking to us. And how I many you know, man, that, that Jojo did an awesome job last week, man. 
I'm sure he's heard it already, but excellent work, man. I was up there and just getting ministered to. And I said, don't use no more scriptures that I'm using, Brother Joe, because. <laughs> but that word abide, what it means is to remain, to stay, to dwell, to reside, to live in. The abiding is more than just a feeling or a belief system. It's an action. I mean, what we're doing is when we are abiding, we're choosing to remain in the things of God. We're choosing to put the work to stay in the things of God. We're choosing to be connected to the vine, Jesus Christ. And the closer we walk with the Lord Jesus, uh, the less uh, that we want to entertain those sinful desires, the less that we'll want to be a part uh, of uh, what the Holy Spirit is saying. Don't be a part of this. Talking to uh, Brother Terry when we came back from the battle retreat, uh, and he says to me, he goes, you know, uh, Brother Manny, he says, man, things are different. Things are different. Uh, he goes, I'm seeing things differently. He says, I'm seeing things through like new perspective, new eyes, because that young man, uh, as many others, had an encounter with Jesus Christ uh, up in that mountain a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago learning how to walk in freedom. And that's what we need to do as a body of Christ is walk in freedom. Book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Freedom is not being able to do uh, what you want and to live and act how you want, uh, but Freedom, what it is, is the ability to, to live and act as Christ would want you to live and act. Someone said that true freedom is not a matter of doing what you want without restraint, but cultivating the right wants and living in obedience to God's will. In other words, freedom results when our wants and our will aligns with God's will. The true freedom that Christ offers us uh, will keep us from things and from habits that will ultimately enslave us. And we need to grasp that because so often, uh, so often prior to coming to Jesus, uh, we think that if I give my life to Jesus, I got to give this up and I got to give that up. And I can no longer listen to this, and I can no longer watch that. Uh, and we, we think about everything that uh, we can't no longer do, and we forget that it is those things uh, that is what's keeping us enslaved. It's those things that is keeping us in bondage. Uh, and when we come to Jesus, uh, he sets us free from the grip that these things uh, invite. We cannot fool ourselves into believing that uh, sin doesn't have power over us. The Bible says that there is pleasure in sin. That's why people pursue sin. That's why people are drawn to it. But it's, it says it's only for a season, that eventually it will catch up. Uh, my wife was talking to me about um, a conversation that he had with uh, her brother this past weekend, Uncle Sal. And what Uncle Sal was saying is, as you serve God, you'll be blessed. God will bless you. God will reward you. He says, but if you serve the devil... It comes at a cost. There's a price to pay. And he comes always to collect. And I said, man, that is heavy if you think about that. You serve Jesus Christ, you're going to experience blessings. You're going to experience love. You're going to experience joy. You're going to experience peace. But when you serve the devil, when you serve this world, you are going to experience misery. You are going to experience hurt. Uh, you are going to experience the bondage of the enemy. Someone said this, uh, you can choose the sin, but you cannot choose the consequences. And that's heavy. We are not to open a door. We are not to open a door to the enemy. Because when we open that door, he'll come in. And he'll take advantage of it. And he'll disrupt the peace. Uh, and he'll make your home hard, and, and he'll bring division in a marriage, uh, and he'll make children become even more rebellious with their parents, uh, and he'll, he'll begin to stir a bunch of strife uh, and resentment uh, within your life. The book of Romans, 
chapter 6, verse 16. He says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. We have a choice. The Bible has always given us a choice, and it's always saying, choose life. You can choose to serve the enemy. You can choose to serve sin. You can choose to serve the flesh. But understand, that all comes with a consequence. But if you choose to serve Jesus, if you choose to serve the living God, that too comes with a consequence. It comes with the blessing. It comes with the reward. It comes with the joy of the Lord. So we need to make decisions concerning the things that we involved ourselves with. If you struggled with drugs and alcohol, stay away from drugs and alcohol. Because sometimes all it takes is one sip or one hit, and you'll find yourself right back there in the enemy's clutches. If you struggled with lying and cheating, don't lie and cheat. Be honest. Tell the truth. I don't know who said it, but I said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember the lies that you've said. Right? If you come out of a lifestyle of gangs and violence, stay away from that influence. Stay away from the neighborhood. And if you got to go back, take Jesus with you. Let him know where you stand. Let him know you're a child of God and that you're no longer so-and-so from the neighborhood. Amen. If you struggled with perversion or promiscuity, stay away from sites. Uh, stay away from uh, places where that's pro prominent. Make yourself accountable to your pastor, to a mature Christian, to your spouse. If you struggle with gambling, stay away from the casinos. You guys want to hear a true story? <laughs> it was about 2008, and it was my birthday, and I was working. And uh, on my break, I uh, was listening to uh, the radio. I was listening to sports, um, sports talk radio. And this individual, he used to make fun of horse racing. He used to say, horse racing isn't a sport, it's a bet. And all of a sudden, him and his wife and some other investors now had stake in a horse that was racing that day. So he was promoting this horse. Now, the issue is, is that um, the horse was, had my name, El Manuel. <laughs> and I said, that's crazy. And then the devil started to lie. He says, the horse has your name, and it's your birthday. That's a sign. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my van, and um, the racetrack is literally like 30 minutes away from where I'm at. You talk about a setup. And I remember one time Pastor Sergio says that sometimes when the enemy would come, he would just kind of play it out in his head from beginning to end. So I started doing that. And I says, well, this horse is going to win today. And if I put 100 down... I'm coming home with a thousand. But then my wife is going to say, where did you get that thousand? <laughs> so now I'm going to have an issue with my wife. But the problem is, is because I'm going to win, I'm going to get hooked. And so I'm going to be back at the racetrack. But this time I'm not going to win. This time I'm going to lose. But I'm going to chase that winner's high, and I'm going to go one more time. And next thing I know, I'm going to have spent all the rent money at the horse's. And my wife is not going to be tolerant of that. And she'll take the kids, and whatever money's left over, and she's gone. And so I said, you know what? Turn the radio off, go right back to work. Nah. And I tell you this, this is a true story. That horse won. And I said to myself, man, the devil's a liar. And to this day, I do not regret having made the decision I made. You know why? Because God has given me so much. God has blessed me. He's always come through. He's always been the provider. He's always been the way maker. And what would I have missed out on? Had I gone and bet on El Manuel, I would have missed, missed out uh, on 23 years worth of marriage. I would have missed out on seeing my children graduate from, from this school. I would have missed out on seeing the birth of my grandchildren. The devil is slick, but God is, I want to say slicker, <laughs> but he is. God knows what he's doing, and he's helping us tonight. All it takes is one little foothold, 
And the enemy will come in like a thief and he'll steal away our peace, our blessings, and our freedoms. And temptation is a real thing. And there's many people, many of us, we battle with temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. We have the power of God in our lives to help us overcome these temptations. And we got to get to a place in our lives where we quote that scripture. It says, we're no longer slaves to sin. And just like that song that we hear sung on the radio, I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And when the enemy comes and he begins to whisper sweet nothings, uh, I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. We have to remind ourselves uh, that we are children of God. And Peter uh, 5, 8, 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, it says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion uh, looking for someone to devour. Sometimes the enemy, he knows and understands that he won't be able to get you to outright sin, but he'll try to be subtle, try to bring in seducing uh, and deceiving spirits. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in the later times, uh, some will fall away from the faith, uh, paying attention to deceitful spirits uh, and teachings of demons. I think if we look around, we can see that there's been just a demonic unleashing in the, in the world today. That uh, it's no longer hidden. It's, it's literally out in the open. It, there's blatant satanic rituals that are taking place at, at concerts uh, and at award shows. Uh, there's corporations that are partnering uh, with uh, other artists uh, to invite the demonic. I was hearing about uh, some artist, uh, he was collaborating with someone to make a shoe that was honoring the devil. And it was rumored that drops of human blood uh, were sprinkled on the soles of this shoe. 666 of them were sold. Okay, think about that. Sold out. And I thought to myself, horrible, man. Why would you invite that? Why would you invite that into your life? Why would you wear something that honors the devil that way? It's because there's a deception that has gone out. There's a, a, a blinding that has taken place. We as Christians who say that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, the Bible says we are to not have any kind of fellowship with it. We are to come out from among them, that we're not even to look or touch uh, the unclean thing. In 2 Corinthians 6, 13 and 15, it says, For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belia? Another name for Belia, or Belia is another name for Satan. He says, there is no harmony. There is no fellowship between these two. And so we got to be careful. We got to be mindful of what we invite into our lives. There's a lot of new age practices that uh, uh, seem to be prevalent in, in this world uh, right now. The use of stones and crystals. The use of, of certain incense to cleanse, quote, cleanse a home. Uh, the study of, of sacred geometry and putting up of symbols and patterns. Uh, I see uh, where I work, uh, there's a lot of individuals, and they got these tattoos of intricate math symbols or um, geometry symbols. Right? People that practice non-biblical meditations or healings uh, or practices uh, Wearing jewelry or bracelets uh, or, pendant, or pendants that promote uh, healing or protection or even good fortune. You know what all this is? Uh, it's witchcraft. There are even personality tests right now that are out there that a lot of people are, are inviting into their lives. Uh, personality tests that are rooted in occultism. And what they do is they invite... Uh, uh, demonic strongholds uh, into your life when you begin to dabble with this, when you begin to experiment or uh, look into it. Those 
Strongholds can manifest in the physical through sickness uh, or affliction. They can manifest in your emotions through uncontrollable anger, rudeness, fits of jealousy, uh, aggression. And it can also manifest in your spiritual walk where you will begin to pull away from the things of God. You become hypercritical of the things of God and of the people of God. And you invite uh, that uh, perverse uh, spirit that will begin to twist uh, and accuse uh, uh, relationships in one another. The Bible says that Satan, he's an accuser of the brethren. But one thing I, I, I see with all of that is that it tells me that there's people that are hungry for the supernatural. They're hungry for something bigger and greater than themselves. They're hungry for a power in their lives. And can I tell you that we serve a supernatural God, that we serve a miracle-working God, that we serve a powerful, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, mighty God that's able. We don't need to look to the heavens. We need to look to the creator of the heavens, Jesus Christ. Uh, he created the stars, uh, the heavens, and the earth. Uh, he knows everything about us, uh, and he knows the plans uh, for a hope and a future that he has for each and every one of us here tonight. Uh, it means that we have to seek God, and when we seek God, it means that we have to die to self. This flesh has to die. How many know that the flesh does not like to die? The flesh likes to resurrect. The old man, the old nature, he likes to resurrect. He thinks he's Lazarus sometimes, and he wants to come back and reminisce about how good we used to have it before Jesus. We need to tell him he's a liar, and he needs to stay dead, man. Because the truth is, is that we, we need a Jesus in our lives. Each and every one of us here tonight needs Jesus Christ uh, in their lives. Uh, it's all about self, self-help, uh, self-love, uh, inner self, outer self, the inner self. Uh, self has become this idol. I like what John the Baptist said. He said it best. He says, I must decrease and he must increase. We need to decrease and Jesus needs to increase in our lives. Romans 6, verse 7 and 8, it's our... It's our text for the evening. It says, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we will also live with him. That moment that Jesus hung on that cross and he said the words, uh, it is finished and gave up his spirit. Uh, the devil thought he won. The devil thought he had the victory. But Jesus flipped it around because it was at that moment that Jesus won. It was at that moment that Jesus broke uh, the bondages of, of the enemy that he made uh, impotent, the Bible says, the power of the enemy. He made it nothing. There's a story in uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 17. And for some of us here tonight, we're going to experience victory over the strategies and over the power of the enemy, if we're going to experience vic uh, deliverance uh, in our lives, uh, we're going to have to establish uh, a routine of prayer and fasting. We're going to have to establish a routine of study, of devotional. We're going to have to establish a routine of daily seeking God, daily seeking the Lord. And in that story, Matthew 17, it was this young boy who uh, had a demonic spirit and would cast him down. He would foam at the mouth and he would uh, go into convulsions. And, and this father brings him to Jesus. And Jesus, uh, he heals this child. He rebukes the demon and he casts him out and he sets this young child free. And the disciples, they come to him and they say, how come we couldn't do that? Why is it that we weren't able to do that? And Jesus, uh, take it as a rebuke. He says, because of your unbelief. He says, because of your unbelief, you weren't able to do this. 
He says, don't you understand if that you just had the mustard seed size of faith that you'll be able to move mountains? Think about that, that small little grain of mustard seed. And he says, that's all you need to move that mountain, that mountain in your life, uh, that mountain in your son or daughter's life, that mountain in your marriage, that mountain in your physical body. It's just that, that faith in Jesus that he's able to do it. And he says this, he says, but there are some kind that do not go out except through prayer and fasting. It's called spiritual warfare. In church, there are, we need to be in the battle. We need to be in the battle. Because sometimes it feels comfortable to experience the revival, the blessings, the mountaintops, where every prayer is just being answered and you're on top and the checks are coming in you know, and the promotions are taking place. And then we forget that we're still in a battle. And we're still in a battle. David forgot that lesson because when all the kings went out to war, David stood behind. And he began to look at things he shouldn't have been looking at. And what happened is that began to invite other things into his life. And he fell. And he was inviting these, these things because he had taken his eyes off of where he needed to be. And that was on the battlefield. If I can have the worship team come up this evening. Church, we are free. The Bible says we are free indeed. John 8, 36, it says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And it's Jesus who makes us free. The Bible says uh, that all authority uh, under heaven and earth uh, belongs to Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, demons are subject to flee. That, that demons believe in Jesus and they shudder because they understand the authority that Jesus has. They understand that Jesus holds those keys, that, that Jesus is the ultimate authority. And the Bible says that Jesus has given each and every child of God authority, authority tonight. Uh, what has you bound? Jesus is greater than that bondage. What has you troubled tonight? The Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. What has you hurting tonight? Jesus is our comforter, and he's given us the Holy Spirit, which helps us and comforts us. What's impossible for you tonight? With man, it might be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And tonight, uh, as a child of God, you have the authority that uh, when the enemy comes in and begins to assault uh, your life, uh, the life of your loved one, your home, uh, your finances, your health, uh, your marriage, uh, God's given you and I the authority to combat the enemy in Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, uh, by the authority of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is our shield. Uh, he's our sword. Uh, he's our high tower. He's our defense. Uh, he's our everything tonight. Uh, we don't fight the fight alone. Uh, we fight it in Jesus. Book of Psalms, chapter 32, verse 7. The psalmist is saying, to the Lord, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble, and you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. What an awesome song that we are surrounded with our own personal song of deliverance. You ever hear a worship song that just as soon as you begin to sing it and, and, and praise alongside with it, you could just feel those chains drop. You could just feel the loosening. Uh, you could just feel freedom coming into your life uh, because you're getting a hold of the freedom maker. You're getting a hold of the one that is singing the song to you, the song of deliverance. And tonight, uh, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed in reverence to God,